Well, thank you, Wayne, and uh, good day, everyone. You know, Harvard professor and research, Dr. Robert Putman, he has done a significant amount of research on what makes people happy and satisfied in life. His research revealed that the key to satisfaction in life is not wealth, it is not position, it's not intelligence or achievement or whether or not or how attractive you may think you are. Rather, the single greatest factor that impacts how satisfied and happy people are in life is deep, satisfying relationships. Now, even though many have found Putman's conclusions profoundly insightful, this is not exactly a new revelation. In Matthew chapter 22, a religious leader approached Jesus and asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? In other words, he was asking, what should be our highest priority in life? Or in light of the um, sermon series that we're in right now, how then shall we live? Well, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and we dealt with that last time. And Jesus went on to say, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, Jesus said, in this life, nothing is more important than loving God and loving people. Now, not that it's wrong to want to achieve things. God is pleased when we take the abilities and the talents that he's given to us and we use them to bless and to provide for people and to make our world a better place to live. Jesus' concern is that we make the building of healthy relationships the primary focus of our lives and that we not cheat on our relationship with God and others in order to achieve more. Because when it's all said and done, our relationships are going to mean a whole lot more to us than our achievements. Now, the sad thing is, it is possible to live your whole life and miss this truth. Several years ago, I came across an article taken from a New York newspaper, which read as follows. Bosses of public, of publishing firm are trying to figure out why one of their employees had been sitting dead at his desk for five days before anyone noticed. George Turkelbaum, 51, who had been employed as a proofreader at the New York firm for 30 years, had a heart attack in the open office area that he shared with 23 other workers. He quietly passed away on Monday, but nobody noticed until Saturday morning when an office cleaner asked why he was still working during the weekend. His boss said, George was always the first guy in each morning, the last guy to leave at night. So no one found it unusual that he was in the same position all that time and didn't say anything. He was always absorbed in his work and he pretty much kept to himself. The paper went on to state, the moral of this story is, don't work too hard, nobody notices anyways. <laughs> now when I first read this story, I wondered how is it possible for something like this to happen? For an individual to be dead in his chair for days in an open office area, and not one of the other 23 employees notice. Now, I know it's New York City, but you would have thought that even one person would have cared enough to say, good morning, George, how you doing, and wait around long enough to get a response. On the other hand, based on the explanation that his boss gave about George, it seems to me that George has to bear some of the responsibility as well. You see, I wonder if no one reached out to George that week 
Because over the years, George focused so much on his work and kept so much to himself and made so little effort to converse with others or to reach out to others that with the passing of time, people just quit trying to reach out to him. Left him alone, thinking that that's the way that he wanted it. Now, we don't know, of course, but whatever the reason, I just think this is a very sad story of a man who died seemingly never having experienced the joy of true friendship. And we know that George isn't the only one. Based on his research, George Gallup Jr. says, even though most people interact with a number of other people during the day, most indicate that they have few close friends and are incredibly lonely. In fact, he says, North Americans are among the loneliest people on the planet. And by the way, Gallup's observations were given long before the COVID pandemic hit, which has only made the problem of loneliness greater and more glaring. God never intended for us to do life alone. When God created the earth and mankind, he created a paradise. It was a perfect community in which Adam and Eve loved each other perfectly. There was no insecurity, no fear, no critical or competitive spirit, no loneliness. However, in Genesis 3, we read that our first parents rebelled against God and decided to do things their way rather than God's way. And when that happened, the community that God desired for mankind to have was fractured. Their relationship with God and with each other was broken. The oneness of spirit that Adam and Eve shared was gone. And folks, analyze it any way you want to, the loneliness and all of the relational challenges that we see in our world today, at school, in our place of work, in marriages, families, friendships, in our communities, can all be traced back to this fundamental decision that occurred back in the Garden of Eden. But God is not a quitter. He is a lover. He's the God of grace, the God of compassion, the God of second chances. And he looked at the negative fallout of Adam and Eve's sin. And he said, I'm going to make a way through the death and resurrection of my son Jesus for everyone to come in right relationship with me and also with each other. I'm going to reestablish a healthy and a loving spiritual family, a new community similar to that which Adam and Eve experienced in the garden. And folks, that new community is the church. Now, to be clear, the church is not a community that functions and lives perfectly because it consists of people like you and me. And we're still in the process of trying to become like Jesus Christ. However, God's plan for the church is perfect. And whenever people live out Christ's vision for the church, their community is characterized by love, acceptance, belonging, being valued and supported, and their impact is revolutionary and life-changing. So let me ask you, how many close friends do you have? To my right here is a table and some chairs, and I want you to imagine that this table is much larger. It's the one that maybe you have in the dining area of your home. It's much larger, and it represents your closest relationships. If you are a Christ follower, then Jesus is at the head of your table. 
But who else is sitting around your relational table? Besides your immediate family, who are the people in your life you would consider to be your closest friends? And what is the nature of your friendship with them? As you're thinking about that, I'm going to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. In verse 9 of that chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about glorifying God in our relationships. And he gives a picture of what a loving spiritual family looks like when it's working right. And in particular, what true friendships look like and the kind of friend we are called to be as Christ followers. Paul writes this, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Paul begins saying, a godly friend is sincere. To be sincere means to be real. It means you aren't pretending to be someone or something that you're not. It means to be humble enough to be open and transparent about your feelings, your fears, and your failures. You get past the small talk and you share with each other at the soul level. Now, of course, we can't be close and transparent like that with everyone. But the Apostle Paul says that closest relationships are real. They're free from hypocrisy and pretense. Godly friends accept one another. They trust each other with confidentiality and therefore feel free to share not only the joys and victories in life, but also their struggles and their fears. In fact, Paul writes that a godly friend cares enough to confront. Notice he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Evil, lies, falsehoods hurt people. They damage, even destroy relationships, reputations. And so we need to take a stand against them. When a good friend, for example, stirs up dissension and division or passes on slanderous gossip, you won't turn a blind eye to that, but you will love them enough to confront them in love in order to uphold the unity of the church. So let me ask you, as you think about the people around your relational table, to what extent are you open and vulnerable with one another? Godly friends are sincere. Furthermore, Paul writes, godly friends are devoted to each other. Now, to be devoted means to be committed to one another, to put high value on cultivating your friendship. To be devoted also means when trouble comes, you choose to see the good in the other, to believe the best about the other, unless or until you have factual information to believe otherwise. Proverbs 18, 24 says, one who has unreliable friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. To be devoted also means to support one another when trouble comes our way. In his autobiography, the former CEO of Chrysler Corporation, Lee Iacocco, he writes that the single biggest shock that he ever had was not when he was fired as CEO of Ford Motor Company, but when all of his friends disappeared. He writes, I was hurting pretty bad. I could have used a phone call from someone who said, you know, let's get together and talk. But most of my friends deserted me. It was the greatest shock of my life. Now, the reality is, Ayakoko's friendships were surface-level friendships. They centered mostly around work. He never really 
made them a priority. He never really got close to his friends. And when the storms hit, the quality of his friendships were, was revealed. Now, there's a lesson here for all of us. What most of us call close friends are actually casual friendships. You know, people we recognize that we wave at, have short conversations with at work or after a church gathering or a hockey game, or even people that we have coffee or lunch with, you know, once a year or so. Not that there's anything wrong with these type of casual friendships, but as Aya Coco learned the hard way, and perhaps as, as some of you may have discovered this past year during COVID, is when the only friendships you have are casual ones, they may not be there for you in your time of need. Not so when you have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Friends you invested in, friends you share a common bond and mission with. And so as you reflect on those who are around your relational table, how devoted are you to each other in the way we've just discussed? If the wheels of your life came off, if you lost your job, if your spouse ended up in emergency, or if some other major crisis hit, would you turn to them for support? Would they be there for you? Perhaps even more importantly, would you be there for them? And then thirdly, godly friends honor and encourage one another. In verse 10, Paul says, honor one another above yourselves. Philippians 2.3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Now, to be clear, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is actually thinking of yourself less. A loving friend thinks more about others. They focus on you rather than themselves. They listen to you. I mean, really listen to you. And want to know how they can support you and reach your God-given potential. They are your greatest cheerleaders, your greatest prayer warriors, and seek to help you succeed and finish well. Now, honoring others also means that you're considerate of the feelings of others and you're patient with people who are irritating. The reality is in every group, in every extended family, there's always at least one difficult person. You know, one individual who's kind of irritating, maybe talks too much, or has quirks, annoying habits, and that just really challenge our patience. Now, by the way, if everyone in your group seems normal to you, then I guess you're the one that we're talking about. <laughs> but seriously, in a loving church family, there is no elitism. There's no snobbery. There's no unhealthy competition or discrimination of any kind. There is genuine humility that seeks to build bridges rather than division and walls. Francis Chan asks the question, does God really expect us to be close to people that we're not related to? To... Does he really expect us to meet together with people and get close to people that we wouldn't choose to be friends with? It seems so unnatural, he says, to be in community with people that you wouldn't choose to be friends with. But then he says, that's just the point. It isn't supposed to be natural but supernatural, a love for others that only God can give you. 
Jesus said even sinners, and by those he was referring to, the really evil and corrupt people, he says even those kind of people know how to love those who love them. But the church goes way beyond that. The church is to be known for its supernatural love, for loving our enemies, people who we don't agree with or who don't agree with us, who irritate us, who we find hard to love. But you see, when we love like that, God grows us in supernatural love. And not only does our face grow, but he is glorified and people are drawn and attracted to Jesus and to his church. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So as you think of those who are around your relational table, to what extent are you honoring and encouraging one another and helping one another to be all that God created you to be and to finish well in life? And then finally, godly friends challenge each other to stay hot for God, to not become lukewarm or half-hearted in our faith. But in Paul's words here in verse 11, to keep your spiritual fervor. So how passionate are you and the people around your table about prayer and about fulfilling the mission that Christ has called us to? How much of your friendship is defined by the focus you give to being on mission. Now near the end of the message, I'm going to talk more specifically and practically about being on mission with your spiritual family. But for now, let me ask you again, as you think about those who are around your table, are you part of a spiritual family like we've been talking about? Do you have any godly friends who love you the way that Paul describes here in Romans 12? Perhaps most importantly, are you such a friend? I say that because often, you know, we sit on our hands and we blame the church or we blame other people for us not having close friends and not being part of a healthy spiritual family. And yes, I realize that sometimes people who claim to be Christians are very self-centered, they're selfish, and far from what Christ calls them to be, and at times are responsible for the hurt and the disappointment that we have experienced in our relationships. But here's the thing. We must not give Satan the victory by giving up or by withdrawing from relationships because that is exactly where he wants us to be, in a position of being hurt, angry, bitter, and all alone. Corrie Ten Boom, along with her family, saved the lives of many Jews by hiding them from the Nazis during the Second World War. And in the end, she not only was put in prison herself, but her family uh, died at the hands of the Nazis for doing what they did. When Corey was a young lady, her fiancé broke up with her and married one of her best friends. Now, understandably, she was shattered by the loss. Sitting with her father one day, he turned to her and he said, Corey, you have a choice. You can go through life blaming others for your hurt and feeling sorry for yourself. Or you can go through life pouring yourself into the lives of others. And while sincerely pouring yourself into others, you will be healed of your loneliness and your pain. 
Well, she decided to follow her father's advice. And not only did God heal her hurt and fill that deep sense of loneliness in her heart, but he used her to have a worldwide impact. As someone once said, I went out to find a friend and could not find one there. I went out to be a friend and friends were everywhere. All that to say this, if God's vision for the church is going to become a reality, it's going to require all of us who call him Lord and King to live radically different lives than the people in our culture are living. You know, I talk to people on a regular basis who desperately want to be part of a loving spiritual family, who want to have genuine friends like we've just talked about, but often they're traveling at warp speed and aren't prepared to make the tough decisions to do what's required. They have the best of intentions, but too often allow other things, lesser things, temporary earthly things, to crowd, crowd out the time needed to build healthy friendships. And consequently, very few people have genuine close friendships because you can't microwave friendship or cultivate friendships in a hurry. As we learned last time, you can't love God in a hurry. You can't pray in a hurry. You can't listen to God or to other people in a hurry. You can't rejoice with those who rejoice in a hurry. You can't mourn with those who mourn in a hurry. And you can't be on mission in a hurry. So here's the thing. If you're feeling alone, or perhaps you realize that even though you have a, a number of casual friends. You don't have any really close friends. And you want to change that in your life. Then you have at least two major decisions to make. First of all, you're going to have to decide who or what you're giving your life to. The Apostle Paul clearly articulated what the focus of his life was. He said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. He had one focus. He had one overarching mission, one voice that he dialed into, one Lord and Master that he gave his life to. Which brings me back to the question that I've already asked several times in this series, and that is for you to live is what? Are you crystal clear about what it is that you're giving your life to. Because you see, how you answer that question will impact everything and everyone in your life. It will impact your values and your goals and your priorities. It will impact your lifestyle. It will impact what you do with your time and the talents that God has given to you and the finances he's provided for you. And yes, it will impact the kind of relationships you have. That's the first decision you need to make. For you to live is what? The second decision is, who are you going to invite to join you? Or who are you going to join with in making that happen, in carrying that out? Having decided who and what you will live for, you need to surround yourself with others of like mind. We were not meant to try to do this on our own. Yes, we need the Lord, but we also need one another. And you see, this is what Jesus did. Jesus loved people, and he had hundreds of acquaintances 
that he prayed for, that he healed, that he set free. And we also know that he had at least 72 disciples who were in his life more often. But when it came to carrying out the mission that his father had entrusted to him, he didn't focus on the hundreds and the thousands. He didn't even focus on the 72 disciples that were kind of following him here and there. No. He invited 12 of his disciples, whom he called apostles, to do life with him and to be on mission with him. And from that group of 12, Jesus had three that he devoted even more of his time with, Peter, James, and John. Now, Jesus' example here is instructive to us. We are not designed to manage a large number of friendships. Friendships that are close and on mission require a significant investment of time and effort on our part. And you can do that perhaps with up to a dozen people, but you cannot do it with 72 people or more. You know, over the years, people have said, you know, our church is too large to develop close friendships. And I'll remind them that you can be just as lonely in a church of 70 as a church of 7,000. You can be just as lonely being here today where 15% of this place is filled with people or when this place is packed with people. You can be lonely in either situation. Now, if all you want are some casual friends who recognize you and wave at you, shoot the breeze for you a few minutes in the parking lot, and maybe go out for coffee once in a while, then perhaps a larger church makes that a little bit more difficult to do. But if you want real, genuine friends who know you, are devoted to you, and are on mission with you, like Jesus wants us to have, then you're going to have to do what Jesus did. And that is he prayerfully invited and then he invested in the life of a small group of people. And if you do that, it won't matter to you how many people gather for a worship service on the weekend like this. Because close friendships aren't forged in a few minutes before or after an in-person worship service. In Luke 6, 12, we read this. One of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray, spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Now notice after spending a whole night in prayer, and what was he doing? He was seeking God's direction and God's affirmation for who he would call into relationship with himself. After that, Jesus called his disciples together, the ones that were there, possibly up to 72 of them. And from this group, he chose 12 among them. Now, if you'd been one of the disciples of those 72, let's say, and you weren't chosen, would you feel like Jesus was um, picking favorites? Well, let me be really clear. Jesus didn't choose the 12 because they were his favorites, but because he had a mission to accomplish, and he knew he couldn't establish a close discipleship relationship with 72 people at once. Rather, he started with these 12, and then he challenged each of them to do the same with a small group of other disciples, and so on and so on. Now, make no mistake, every disciple Jesus invited to walk more closely with, they could have said no. We often don't think about that, but they could have. 
They could have said, Jesus, what you're asking is too much. It's, it's too big a sacrifice. I do not have the time for this. They could have said, you know, well, Jesus, you know, I, I would have liked to have said yes, but, you know, you invited those three disciples over there to join you, and I've got to be honest, I don't like them very much. They kind of irritate me, so count me out. Now, I draw that to your attention because some people that you invite to join you on mission will say no for various reasons, and it will break your heart. But it is their decision. You know, the mission that my wife Gwen and I have felt called to most of our married life is the same as the mission of our church, to make disciples, to introduce people to Jesus, and to help them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Early in our ministry at Center Street, when we worked with youth and with uh, young adults, we invited others to join us in introducing youth and young adults to Jesus. And God used us together to see many young people and many young adults come to faith in Christ and grow in their walk with Christ. Now, not everyone that we invited said yes. But those that did, we not only grew close to, but we had a blast loving and introducing youth and young adults to Jesus. And when I was called to be senior pastor of our church, and we no longer were meeting weekly or working together closely or hanging out in our house the way that we did most every week. Many of these leaders carried on investing in youth and young adults and in other ministries. When I became senior pastor, for a number of years, we did our best just to be available to everyone. And we tried to maintain literally hundreds of relationships, including accepting invitations for breakfast, for coffee, for lunch, for dinner. We had large groups of people in our home on a regular basis. And we thoroughly enjoyed the times we spent with so many people in our church, and we would regularly give thanks to God for the amazing people who are part of our church. But over time, not only were we getting exhausted. But we realized that Jesus had called us to do more than just visit with hundreds of people once a year or once every two years. He called us to invite people who were open to join us in making disciples. In the same way that people joined us in loving and discipling youth and young adults. And so a number of years ago, we invited a few others to join us in leading an alpha group in our home. And together with these friends, we invited people that we knew were seeking spiritual answers. And through that experience, we saw a number of people come to faith in Christ. And we didn't end the relationship at that point with these people and these new Christians. No, we walked with them. We answered their questions. We took them through the essentials of the faith. In subsequent years, we sent many people out from our group, challenging them to invite others to join them, even as they had been invited to join us and to do the same thing. And we invited a new group to join us in our mission. Presently, we have a leadership group of 10 people who have each invited a small group of people into their lives to support and pray for one another, 
to learn how to disciple a new Christian in the foundations of the faith, how to give an answer for the hope they have within, and to encourage and challenge each other to build relationships with people who don't know Jesus and to pray that they will be open to join us when we do an Alpha again in the near future. And yes, COVID restrictions have made things more complicated. But through Zoom and other platforms, we're able to meet all together uh, as a large group, a missional community of nearly 40 people, and then to break up into smaller groups and chat rooms. Is it ideal? Not at all. If we've learned anything this past year, it is that nothing beats being in person. Amen? But even so, God continues to do his work through technology and through this pandemic. Now, if people around your table or your spiritual family are already functioning this way, and you have close friends who are passionately leaning into the mission that God has called us to, then consider yourself blessed and be sure to thank God regularly for the gift of genuine community that you're part of and never, never take it for granted. Never take your foot off the pedal. You keep investing in what God has blessed you with. You see, even though God wants us to enjoy this life, we are not here just to put in time to drink lemonade in the shade and live the good life. We are here to be Christ's representatives, to be his hands, his feet of love and grace to our world. It's an incredible adventure that we've been called to be part of, but it's going to require us to be wholly committed to God and to God alone. It's going to require us to attune our ears to the voice of God and having the courage to follow where he leads us. It's going to require us to pray that God would bring people around our table who will not only be genuine friends, but will walk arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with us in fulfilling the greatest cause ever given to man. And to do so, friends, you're going to have to be intentional. You're going to have to take some risks. You're going to have to die to your pride and your insecurities and take the risk to introduce yourself to someone, to, to start a conversation with someone, whether in person or online. It's going to require you stepping out and serving in a ministry that God calls you God calls you to. It's going to require starting a group or joining a group. Perhaps this past year has revealed to you how few, if any, close friends you have at all. Well, that won't change, folks, unless you risk being a friend and getting connected to a small group. And one way to do that, by the way, is to sign up for our Taste and See groups, which are going to be starting next week. This is an eight-week experience designed to give you just a taste, a glimpse of the spiritual family we've been talking about. To sign up, and go to our website, and to look for, and look for join a group tab. Or call the church and just ask for information on how you can join such a group. You know, church, you've heard me say this many times before but I, I just can't think of a greater cause to give my life to than to live all out for Jesus with people who have the same passion I can't think of anything more exciting and fulfilling than to come to the end of my life and to realize that because I devoted myself to the mission that 
God has called us to. And I invited others to join me on that mission. That there are people now who have been blessed and helped abundantly in this life and are on their way to heaven for eternity. I wish that for every one of you. I really do. And I pray that it will be so to the glory of God and for the sake of a world that needs the Jesus that we know and love. Would you just open your hands to the Lord right now and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? And Lord, what do you want me to do about it? opportunity to respond to what we've heard and to respond to the question for me to live is what? May you be able to sing it with conviction and from your heart. God bless you.